Hello and welcome to my channel, I would like to discuss in this video the phantom time theory and thereby I will examine the theory only on the basis of the Gregorian calendar reform. In most videos I have seen so far only wrong information, the people have probably never really dealt with the whole theory. So, is there a phantom time? Quite possible if we look at the exact sources. Let's go. The core of the phantom time thesis is the Gregorian calendar reform in 1582, carried out by Pope Gregory XIII. The reason for the calendar reform was the inaccuracy of the Julian calendar existing until then and the resulting incorrect calculation and dating of Easter. The goal of the Gregorian calendar reform was purely ecclesiastical. One wanted to have finally a reliable calculation method called, Computus Ecclesiasticus, available, in order to be able to calculate the date of Easter in advance. It was especially important to the Pope that the changes of the existing calendar be limited to the absolute minimum. The calendar we are talking about here is a solar calendar, but there is also a lunar calendar that was also adjusted in the course of the reform and brought into line with the solar calendar. The lunar calendar is at least as important for the calculation of Easter as the solar calendar. But this is only a small additional information, because the lunar calendar is unimportant for this consideration, and now for some important information. The Julian calendar had 365.25 days and the Gregorian solar calendar has 365.2425 days. Thus the Julian calendar is approximate 11 minutes and 14 seconds too long. This deviation leads to the fact that with the Julian calendar every 128.2 years a day is added and thus the equinox in spring is shifted by one day towards the beginning of the year. But the Gregorian calendar is also not completely exact because the actual duration of a tropical year amounts to 365.2419 days, thereby the Gregorian calendar is approximate 27 seconds too long. But this inaccuracy would add up to a whole day only in 3236 years. The Julian calendar was introduced in 45 BC by Julius Caesar, Caesar's astronomical advisor was the Alexandrian astronomer Sausagenes. The error of the Julian calendar is 128.2 years and by the year 1582 an error of 12.69 days had thus accumulated. We can round up to 13 days here. Due to this error the equinox, in the spring, had shifted up to the year 1582 on March 11th. If one adds the 13 error days to the 11th of March, one comes to the conclusion that Julius Caesar, with his calendar reform, must have put the spring equinox on the 24th of March. If one looks at however some internet sources then the March 25th is indicated there, thus that is already the first strangeness. The goal of the Gregorian reform was to bring the equinox back to March 21st, and in doing so, Pope Gregory did not refer to the spring equinox of Julius Caesar but to the spring equinox at the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. This decision was effected under the papal bull, inter gravissimas, by omitting 10 days between October 4th and October 15th in the calendar's day count in 1582. These 10 days added to the 11 days in March thus result in March 21st, as desired by the Pope. The goal was to set the earliest possible Easter date between March 22nd and March 25th, which therefore gives a latest Easter date, between April 22nd and April 25th. So that was the given framework for the earliest and latest Easter dates. The practice of pre-calculation practiced until then is evident from a standard textbook of the Middle Ages the Computus Ecclesiasticus of John of Sacro Bosco. The book was written in 1232, the author, John of Sacro Bosco was a Dominican friar and taught in Paris. The book was later frequently copied and printed from about 1450. It says the following about the earliest and latest dates of Easter, the first possible date of Easter will be the 11th day before the calends of April, which corresponds to March 22nd. And further it is written. As the last date, Easter is celebrated on the 7th day before the calends of May, which corresponds to April 25th. To calculate the day of the calends of the upcoming month, counting the number of days remaining in the current month is necessary, then adding two to that number. For example, April 22nd is the 10th day before the calends of May, because 8 days are left in April and both end dates are included in the total. 
But in his book there is another interesting passage which is about the creation of the world, and the world was made fifteenth calends of April, whence the first day of the torch and the sun in Aries is usually marked there. And this sentence is strange, because here it is about the spring equinox, the first day in Aries, which is set here by the author on March 18th. The quotations come from a copy of the original book from the 13th century. The March 18th would be wrong both with a reckoning to Julius Caesar and to Pope Gregory. But we have to leave this sentence as it is because it does not help us with our problem. The first advocates of calendar reform were Sacro Bosco, Roger Bacon, Robert Grostest and Nicholas Cusanus. In the beginning, this reform was supposed to serve only the Church to calculate the date of Easter. But only Aloysius Lilius and the Jesuit priest Christophorus Clavius developed a final reform concept which was implemented in the end. After the Council of Trento, 1545-1563, the problem of calendar reform was soon to be solved. The important question was on which date the spring equinox would be placed. The demands for calendar correction at that time ranged from 10 to 15 days, which therefore goes from March 21 to March 26. The Viennese mathematician Paulus Fabricius said, it would be much more appropriate if the state of Julius Caesar was restored, with which, so to speak, the Roman monarchy in the Christian church began. Thus he pleads for the omission of 13 days. The Italian mathematician Giuseppe Maletti called for setting the equinox on March 25th, which required a correction of 14 days. The reason for March 21st is to be found in the sequence of the church liturgy. The Easter festival cycle begins with Septuagesima, the third Sunday before Ash Wednesday, and ends with the last day before the first Sunday of Advent, the beginning of the new church year. However, this festive cycle is not fixed but shifts with a variance of 35 days within the church year. This is caused by the two Easter boundaries, March 22nd as the earliest date and April 25th as the last date. From this follows for the church liturgy that at least 23 and at most 28 Sundays have to lie after Pentecost and before the first Sunday of Advent. This regulation is found in the liturgical texts concerned and it hangs on March 21st as the day of the spring equinox. If one shifts this also only by one day forward and with it the Easter border, then the 28th Sunday after Pentecost does not fit any more before the first Advent Sunday what is not compatible with the liturgical texts. This information is not very interesting for us but I just want to show you why the 21st of March was held so strongly and why this is probably the most important reason for fixing the spring equinox on the 21st of March. Finally, it was up to the Jesuit priest Christoph Clavius to initiate the calendar reform starting in 1576, and in the process he was confronted with various demands for corrections. On the one hand, it is the liturgy-related adherence to March 21, on the other hand, the demands of 10 to 15 days expressed in expert opinions of the European universities. Clavius decided for the 21st of March and Pope Gregory justified the 21st of March in his encyclical, Inter Gravissimus, with the fact that also the fathers of the Council of Nicaea had put the spring equinox on the 21st of March. The translated original sentence from Inter Gravissimus reads, so that now the spring equinox, which was set by the fathers of the Council of Nicaea on the twelfth day before the calends of April, may be reset to that place. Basically, Two topics were dealt with at the Council, the fight against the heresy of Arius and the elimination of the different practices of calculation for Easter Sunday and for an agreement on a common celebration of Easter for the whole Church. Of the original minutes of the Council, the following are preserved, the letter of the Synod to the Church of Alexandria and a circular letter to the Oriental Churches, from Emperor Constantine, who had convened the Council. The letter of the Synod says only the following. We also give you the joyful news that unity has been achieved in the matter of the Most Holy Easter, in that, thanks to your prayers, all the brethren of the East, who until now have followed the Jews, will from now on celebrate Easter with the Romans, with us, and with all those who agree with us. There was never a commitment to March 21st at the Council, and thus Pope Gregory's justification had been a white lie to gain greater acceptance for March 21st. From a historical perspective, 
such a determination by the Council in 325 would not have been possible at all, as it would have required a complete calendar reform. And from a political point of view, the Christians were not in a position to implement such a change at that time. Only the Roman Emperor could have carried out a calendar reform, but this was never an issue, as the error of the current Julian calendar was not even noticed at this time. The reasoning of today's historians regarding March 21st and the Council of Nicaea is therefore misleading and completely false. It's also important to mention that even after the Council there was no agreement among Christians and the different Christian churches continued to celebrate Easter according to different rules of reckoning. In 525, March 21st was mentioned by Dionysius Exiguus in his work, Liber de Pascal. Dionysius Exiguus set himself the task of eliminating the discrepancy between Rome and Alexandria in the methods of calculating Easter and persuading the Romans to adopt the Alexandrian practice. For us, the only important fact is that at the time of Dionysius there was no doubt about March 21st, and nowhere is there any mention of the spring equinox moving. The Alexandrian astronomer and mathematician Anatolius of Laodicea already knew in the 3rd century that the vernal equinox was on March 21. The error in the Julian calendar of one day in 128 years had not been noticed until then. It was only at the beginning of the 13th century that it was noticed that the spring equinox had shifted significantly. These are all indications that show us that the actual spring equinox fell on March 21st at the time of Caesar's calendar reform and that March 25th was only a traditional and social date. The solution to this riddle lies in the question of the day on which Julius Caesar set the astronomical spring equinox, as this is the only way to determine definitively how much time actually passed between Julius Caesar and Pope Gregory. Now we finally come to the most important question. Where does the reference to March 21st come from and did Julius Caesar actually set the vernal equinox on March 25th when he reformed the calendar, but first some basic information, before we come to the crucial question, astronomers in ancient Babylon already knew that the sun moves at different speeds on its apparent orbit along the ecliptic, so the angular velocity is different at different points on its orbit. This is reflected in the fact that the winter half-year is shorter than the summer half-year, we now know that this fact simply follows from the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the Sun and Kepler's second law. This means that there is always a fixed distance between the four equinoxes. Today's division looks like this. Winter solstice to spring equinox 89 days, spring equinox to summer solstice 93 days, summer solstice to southward equinox 93 days, southward equinox to winter solstice 90 days. Plinius, who wrote Naturalis Historia in 79 AD, divided the year as follows. Winter solstice to the spring equinox 90 days, spring equinox to summer solstice 93 days, summer solstice to southward equinox 93 days, southward equinox to winter solstice 89 days. If, for example, the spring equinox is set to March 21st, the other three dates are self-evident. Summer solstice June 22nd, southward equinox September 23rd and winter solstice December 22nd and in leap years it is one day earlier in all equinoxes. The following is interesting. We know pretty much everything about Caesar's calendar reform except the exact date of the spring equinox, and that's the big problem. In 1607, Clavius reported in his work Novi Calendarii Romani Explicatio that there were two different definitions of the equinoxes at the time of Caesar and Augustus. There was an Equinoctium Politicum Vel Civil with March 25th as the spring equinox and an astronomical Equinoctium Astronomicum Seu Verum, but Clavius does not mention the date here either. The Equinoctium Politicum was a fixed date and did not change even in leap years. In contrast, the Equinoctium Astronomicum represented the actual equinoxes of the year and is decisive for our question about phantom time. It is important to note that both Caesar and Pope Gregory took great care to protect public opinion when reforming their calendars. 
For this reason, Caesar left March 25th as the political beginning of spring, because it was a fixed date, which helped farmers in particular. There is a work by Columella from the time of 60 AD called De Re Rustica, which translates as, On Agriculture. This work was a large compendium on the entire agricultural system of the time. Throughout the work there are instructions on when to carry out certain agricultural practices and many of these practices are based on the four equinoxes. I have used a German translation from the year 1769. In the eighth section of the second chapter it says, Virgil does not want spelt and wheat to be sown before the Pleiades set. Virgil refers to the Roman poet, and then it goes on to state the exact date of the Pleiades' demise. The Pleiades set on the 32nd day after the southward equinox, which falls on September 23rd. If you now place September 23rd in the division of the year, the remaining three equinoxes result automatically. This means that the winter solstice falls on December 22nd and the spring equinox on March 21st. So this gives us a clear calendar date from the 1st century AD and thus the decisive proof that Julius Caesar never set the astronomical spring equinox on March 25th but on March 21st. The error of one day in 128 years in his calendar meant that when Pope Gregory reformed the calendar, the spring equinox had already moved to March 11th. It has therefore shifted by 10 days, which corresponds to around 1,280 years. Around 300 years are missing. These historical facts do not necessarily prove that we have a phantom time, but they do provide important evidence for this phantom time theory. Because from this point onwards, other areas within historical science need to be investigated. Now we are at the end of this video and if you liked the video, please subscribe to my channel and I will continue to deliver some interesting videos in the future.